I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. All right, Chris, let's talk about mitochondrial function and energy. I'm really excited to discuss this with you. Sure, thanks. Um, so mitochondria is, is basically an organelle inside of our cells that acts as the power supply of our cells and consequently our body. It produces ATP. It takes the oxygen that you breathe and the foods that you consume and it transforms that into energy. What happens when people have what's called mitochondrial dysfunction? M- mitochondrial dysfunction comes from, well, it can be associated with many things, but usually it's due to, uh, in, in a non-disease state, if you will, it's due to uh, less uh, activity. If people are sedentary and leading a sedentary life, the mitochondria are less robust, if you will. So uh, exercise and, and movement is one way to keep your mitochondria very active and, of course, also a very healthy diet. What are some of the diseases associated with acute mitochondrial dysfunction? What happens if your mitochondria just totally tank as you get older and you don't do anything to fortify them? What are some of the, well, the issues with that? Well, as, as we get older, we, we sort of we peak in our 30s in terms of muscle function, if we just talk about muscle function for a second. Uh, and as we get older, beyond our 30s, the muscle function starts to decline, and, but we can maintain it, uh, and it can be uh, still very, um, let's say, robust, although not as good as our 30s, as long as we're, um, as long as we're exercising on a regular, uh, regular basis. But people who aren't exercising very well and very often, that you, you often see that they're, you know, that they're not very mobile and in, into the later part of their life. Yeah. And what about um, mitophagy? Could you explain sure. kind of the recycling system? I know some people are familiar with autophagy where your cells are recycling. How does that work yeah. with mitochondria? So inside of our uh, cells, there's a process that's innate to maintain a sort of a homeostasis of our mitochondria. And this process is called uh, mitophagy. And essentially what happens is that as mitochondria are producing energy, the mitochondria can get damaged uh, basically through reactive oxygen species. It's producing energy and reactive oxygen species uh, that are produced, and that causes uh, the damage that then needs to be cleared away. Otherwise, the mitochondria won't be very functional on a, yeah, on a continuous basis. And so the cell has this process that's called mitophagy in which these damaged mitochondria are then sort of sequestered into a recycling pathway and they're um and they're broken down into their component parts and then these component parts are then sort of used to reconstitute uh mitochondria essentially and grow mitochondria which then divide and and keep the bioenergetic status of the cell at its optimal place how old are mitochondria do we know? Um, <laughs> well, mitochondria are, are passed from, uh, we get the mitochondria in our body come from our, uh, from our mothers uh, originally. And so, um, and, and in terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of the mitochondria itself, there's the cells, all of our cells, uh, with the exception of our red blood cells, contain mitochondria. And so as you, um, yeah, and depending upon the cell type, the, there may be more or less mitochondria. So there's not, a, I would say, a particular age of the mitochondria. It's a very dynamic process of recycling. I think what I was getting at is, were they here before us? Or, you know what I mean? Like, because are mitochondria essentially a, a bacteria? Would that be a valid statement? Well, like, it, like what are they? And I guess, how did they show up throughout our evolution as a species? Or are they just like in the first human from day one? Or well, I, I think that's, that comes with the evolution that it's, uh, it's been uh, believed that the mitochondria uh, are basically other bacteria and that they sort of somehow fuse during evolution with our cells to then allow our cells to, to do produce ATP. Essentially. Okay. And yeah. so if we're getting, uh, if we're inheriting 
mitochondria from our mother, would that mean that if the mother's um, mitochondrial function is robust and she has them working functionally and has a lot of mitochondria, would that offspring have a better uh, chance of success and, and energy and mitochondrial function? For sure. Yeah. I mean, the, as we receive the mitochondria from our, um, from our mother, it, this is a, a great sign in terms of your longevity. So uh, you can, normally you would see that people who have uh, mothers with uh, highly functional mitochondria, they're going to be also um, very fit as well. So say a woman wants to, uh, you know, is preparing to give birth and wants to ensure that they have an abundance of mitochondria and that they're well-functioning. Are there any uh, tests that have developed where one could assess that? Like you could test your micronutrient levels, for example. Are there means by which people can test their mitochondria? Well, you can certainly uh, evaluate if you have any type of mutations in your mitochondria, in the DNA of your mitochondria. Uh, but in terms of just overall uh, health of mitochondria, uh, I don't believe that there's any test, but that's that I'm not aware. So if you're testing the function of them, what are those tests called? And if someone listening wanted to go, you know, say again, a mother is preparing to uh, get pregnant is like, oh man, I want to pass off the, the best and most um, robust mitochondria. What kind of testing would one do to determine the function? Is there like a blood test or something that easy? I, I don't think more sophisticated? I, I don't think there's a standardized test to, okay. for for that purpose. Other than if if you have a a disease, as I was mentioning before. Ah, okay. And so, what are some of the common ways that people, whether they be mothers to be or not, um, can improve their mitochondrial function? Well, certainly, it's a, I would say a combination of um, just the, your lifestyle choices. So, uh, one is exercise, of course. So when you're, um, if you're exercising a lot, uh, the whole process of exercise stimulates mitochondria, uh, an improvement in mitochondrial function, mitochondrial biogenesis, and in fact, also, uh, mitophagy. So, uh, if you're, uh, running on a regular basis, that helps you maintain your mitochondria at, at its peak. What about, uh, fasting? Does that have any value in this? Yes. Well, fasting as well is, uh, is known to, you know, caloric restriction is, is known to also um, improve mitochondrial function in general. Yeah. And how does eight, um, so if what we're going for by fortifying our mitochondria and being mindful of their, their health, um, because we want the ATP, the energy that they're producing, uh, how does something like uh, using NAD that improves the production of ATP play into the mitochondria? Are there things other than ATP that we can use as an intervention to ensure the, the production of ATP? Well, in terms of uh, general supplements uh, today that, that just help your mitochondria function better, there, is, uh, there are the coenzyme Q10 and L-carnitine that, that people use a lot. Uh, but that's more for the general functioning of the mitochondria. Uh, now, our product uh, is urolithin A, and I guess we'll talk about that a little yeah. bit later. And that's targeting this pathway of mitophagy, as I was mentioning before, which is essential uh, for basically the turnover and the maintenance of a sort of robust bioenergetic pool of mitochondria inside of our cells. Have you looked into, speaking of mitochondria, because I've done a couple shows on this, have you looked into um, deuterium and deuterium depletion as it pertains to ATP production by chance? No, we haven't. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. Uh, and the audience, the older listeners will be familiar with this. But uh, over time, because there's so much of this heavy hydrogen mm -hmm. in our atmosphere, water, air, foods, things like that, especially processed foods and industrial foods, uh, that we build up these really high levels of this um, this deuterium, uh -huh. and it gets in the nanomotors of the mitochondria and slows down the production of ATP. It's really interesting. So uh, there's companies now that are making deuterium depleted water, and so if you kind of dilute the metabolic water in your system by drinking this water, then ultimately you start to uh, deplete your 
deuterium levels and bring them down. And it's, it's an interesting thing. It's probably the most nuanced and kind of out there thing that I've found in terms of the mitochondria and, uh, and the ATP production. Um, and I'll put that in the show notes for people that are like, what are you talking about? But whenever I talk to someone about mitochondria, I'm like, do you know about this thing? Is it okay. legit? And there seems to be a lot of science around it. So um, I think many people are familiar with the fact that, um, you know, there are foods that we can eat that have constituents that are supportive to various systems in our body. And, uh, you know, I think when it comes to eating plants and eating fruits and vegetables and things like that, oftentimes, um, there are benefits and there are ingredients, molecules in these foods that have the ability to support our health, but um, oftentimes they're not in adequate amounts or there are other um, not so desirable molecules or tons of sugar and things like that. Sure. Um, aside from what we're going to end up talking about, which is uh, pomegranate, which is really fascinating because I would have never thought of pomegranate as a superfood. Um, are there other foods that you know we can derive benefit from but more so if they're concentrated and isolated versus you know eating um you know vegetables with tons of um you know oxalates or eating fruits that have tons of sugar if someone thinks of vitamin c that's great well i'll drink a huge glass of orange juice and and wreck my metabolism and, and uh, glucose levels you know yeah. what uh what do you think about I guess that in general about some of the foods and things that are good for us, but also kind of have a downside when it comes to consuming mass quantities of them. Yeah, I, w I would say that uh, a lot of the juices um, are very rich in sugar. So if you're consuming a lot of juice, that's probably not um, ideal. Uh, and I guess in moderation, everything is is fine. But um, in terms of... Uh, in terms of specific foods, food items that you could concentrate. Of course, there's today there's a, a big interest in in making supplements of extracts of of different foods that normally are ex, where they extract the sugar and remove the sugars from them uh, to give to allow people to sort of get that mixture of uh, yeah nutrients that you might get from that particular food type. Um, and and what's your uh, what's your field of study? How did you get into this game anyway? I wanted to ask you that in the beginning. It slipped my mind. I just jumped right in. What's mitochondria? <laughs> what uh, you know? What's what's your uh, I guess expertise in your field? Well, when in the very beginning when we started the company, um, I had been uh, in the space of uh, investing in into nutrition companies, and we thought you know this would be you know at the time. Uh, I was seeing a lot of science uh, going on uh, in terms of, you know, in the, in the laboratories of, uh, uh, in phytochemist laboratories and biology laboratories, but there was very little uh, sort of cross talk and cross pollination between the two. And I thought that this was an area that was ripe for disruption. And so at the time I thought, let's, um, you know, let's, exhort, let's examine this and see how we can explore uh, the benefits of foods by applying the right science to it. And that was sort of the, the starting thoughts. And so how did you uh, stumble upon this urolithin A? It took me all morning to memorize how to say it. <laughs> urolithin A. You know, there's things out there like quercetin, right? So yeah. you have um, capers are really high in quercetin. But again, like you're not going to eat four jars of capers probably for breakfast right um and this as i understand is derived from part of the pomegranate when when did you first hear about urolithin a and start to delve into the research around it well, well we initially started looking at the pomegranate because it was at the time uh there was some some uh initial studies on the pomegranate on the pomegranate juice there was talk about antioxidants so we started to learn more about the pomegranate we thought maybe this is a um an attractive fruit uh, in terms of its molecular constituents. And so we went uh, and we got pomegranates from different sources. We started juicing the pomegranates and learning about what was inside uh, and what concentration levels and, and then making extracts and, and studying the different compounds inside. And, and at one point um, after studying some of the compounds, we, um, we came to the thought that there might be something to the um, metabolites, is, which is a class of compounds called urolithins, 
uh, one of which is urolithin A. That's and these metabolites are produced when you consume the uh, the compounds inside of the pomegranates, uh, the class that are called the elagitannins. Uh, in that class, you have puny collagen, which is very rich in the pomegranate. So when you consume that, what happens is that your gut microflora then will uh, transform that into metabolites. And one of those metabolites is urolithin A. And, and a lot of the work at the time had been showing how this was basically a way to eliminate the, some of the compounds into, uh, that are coming from the pomegranate. Uh, what we thought was perhaps that this is something that actually has a biological importance. And so we started studying that as well. Are there other foods uh, beside uh, pomegranate that are high in this urolithin A? Well, the, so there's, uh, there are a number of foods that have uh, these precursor compounds, these elagitannins, and, and there, there tend to be these, uh, these small fruits like, and, and berries, such as, uh, let's say, raspberry, blackberry, and then there's some nuts like walnuts and pecans that have um, these precursor compounds. And so if you consume them as well, you'll, you'll also uh, get exposed to urolithin A, but only if you have the right gut microbes. Ah, right. Yep. So there, there are foods, pomegranate and these others, that contain the metabolites, but then it's still up to your body to produce the compound urolithin A, which is what we're going for for the mitochondrial function and right. autophagy. And so. Right. So, a lot of, so there's, a, there's several foods that will have those those starting compounds as elagitannins. Yeah. Got it. Elagitans. Elagitannins. Elagitannins. Okay. Yeah. So I know the word tannins. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. You know, antioxidant rich foods often are accompanied by tannins. So if somebody's gut is wrecked and they just, you know, have um, uh, dysbiosis and things like that, is it more difficult for them to produce that? Um, or is it a genetic thing where some people's guts are just kind of built to uh, create that process and others aren't? I don't think it's really understood why some people's gut microflora are able to make this conversion of the elagitanins to the urolithin A, and some aren't. It, it, we've, we've conducted a study that we recently published in, um, in the European Journal of Nutrition that basically shows that there's around 40% of the population, at least in our study in the U.S., that are able to make this conversion from uh, into urolithin A when when drinking pomegranate juice. So with the stuff that you guys make, I'll show the camera. It's called Timeline. Comes in a pouch. By the way, it's actually pretty delicious. Oftentimes, when, <laughs> oftentimes, you know, I I go to conferences and stuff, and I try everything, and some things don't taste that great. Yeah, I was like, this actually kind of tastes like pomegranate. I mean, it's not like a fake sweet thing. Um, so with with Timeline, for example. Are some people, would some people take a product like this and not be able to actually have that conversion take place? And how would they know if it's going to work for them, whether they eat, you know, 40 pomegranates in a sitting or they get a concentrate like this? Well, so what's important to understand is that a uh, timeline takes all of the issue of the gut microbiota uh, out of the equation oh. because we're giving urolithin A uh, directly into the product. Oh, so it's already like pre-converted for lack of a better so, term. Well, yeah. So it, you're, you're getting the actual end product that you would normally get if you were converting uh, the elagitannins into the urolithin A. Okay. You're just receiving the urolithin A. Oh, cool. Yeah. Damn, that's a pretty badass discovery. And so the nice thing about it is we give a very a precise dose that we've studied in clinical studies. And so you know exactly how much you're getting as opposed to, you know, a normal diet where y you don't really know what you're getting because one, you, you know, you'll have to eat the same type of foods every day and yeah. And, and then you have the whole issue of the conversion. We, in the latest study that I was referring to, we compared the amount of urolithin A that you get from uh, a drinking a glass of pomegranate juice to taking uh, 500 milligrams of mitopure, which is our uh, urolithin A. And we have we see that over a period of 24 hours, you have six times more uh, urolithin A uh, wow. exposure. So, Damn. yeah. So essentially, if you're taking, uh, if you want to take juice and you are a converter, you would need to take six 
large glasses of pomegranate juice. I wonder how much sugar is in six glasses of pomegranate juice. <laughs> more than you, <clears throat> more than you probably want to yeah. consume. I mean, not to yeah. vilify sugar. To be honest, last night um, I snuck down to the market here and bought all kinds of things full of sugar and felt it this morning. Um, <laughs> but it, it's for me like. I'm not, I don't vilify sugar, but if I'm going to eat yeah. sugar, I'm going to eat something that probably tastes more rich and satisfying than six glasses of pump. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so are you deriving uh, this urolithin A from the, the uh, juicy fruity part of the pomegranate or is it coming in kind of the rind and those bitter yellow bits that are we try to avoid when we pull one apart and eat yeah, it? Yeah, so these elagitanins that I was referring to are are really found into the um, the white part of the flesh inside the pomegranate, the, the bitter part. So these elagitanins are very bitter tasting. So the more bitter your juice is, the more elagitanins you'll have in your juice. And typically that part of the pomegranate is the part that people avoid eating, right? I mean, it's yeah. kind of the fun of opening a pomegranate is picking out the, the little seeds. seeds yeah. You have the reward of that and you kind of discard the the yellow bitter bits. Yeah, yeah. It's similar maybe to, um, to oranges. I remember when I was a kid and my mom would cut up an orange, she would always recommend that I, that I eat the, I guess the, the rind, is that what it's called? You know, yeah. the, the soft fluffy part. Oh, you got to eat that for whatever. She was kind of a health nut like me. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's unlikely somebody's going to eat that part of the pomegranate, honestly. Yeah, it's not uh, your preferred uh, part of the yeah. fruit. Yeah. Okay, so when we get this um, urolithin A directly like this, how is that impacting the mitochondria positively? Well, so it, back to the first part of our discussion, we were talking about mitophagy. So we studied uh, the urolithin A, urolithin A for a while, and we, um, we saw that when we were testing it in... Uh, in the lab, in vitro, and in, in cell culture, we saw that it was improving mitochondrial function. And we took a deeper dive to look into the mechanisms, and then we understood, um, after a lot of studies, that it was stimulating this whole process of mitophagy. And it was very exciting because it was the first compound uh, that's been shown to induce uh, mitophagy uh, in, in cells. Wow. Yeah, natural wow. natural compound that was safe. Of course, there's compounds that can do that, but that are toxic. Um, and uh, and so this is uh, it was very exciting. We started sort of translating that to see how what its impact would be on not only mitochondrial function but also sort of physiological function. And we did this through um, extensive preclinical testing uh, and looking at muscle function in uh, in mice and in yeah in rodents. Um. When you're doing a test like that and you're using mice, how do you uh, titrate the dosage to get the equivalent of what a human would eat? So I think these packets were like 500 milligrams. So essentially, there's um, the the main ways is is basically to feed the the animals with it, and uh, and that and you can balance that out how much you you want to uh, administer in that way. So you come up with uh, like the human equivalent dose for a tiny little animal essentially to determine if well, there's going to be a similar response in a human. Is well, that how it works? Well, it's more the the reverse. You start out with doses that would be, um, that you think might be uh, suitable in uh, an animal setting. And then when you when you translate that to humans, you, you then scale that up. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah. And so... Uh, let me see where I wanted to go with this. With the with the microbiome piece, uh, is it not that necessary? I mean, obviously everyone wants to have a healthy microbiome, but in this case, since we're just taking the compound that we want directly and we don't have to go through that, how much does gut health play in the success of taking your lithin A directly like this? Well, it's a good question. I, I, I don't believe that the gut health plays uh, an essential role there. Of course, it's always important to have a, a healthy gut. And, and so uh, it, it's hard to say what, what the impact would be if you had some type of yeah, malfunction of your gut or disease. Uh, but for a general healthy person, which is the target audience that, of course, we go after with, uh, with food supplements uh, and nutrition products, um, I, I don't see there being an impact there. 
Cool. And uh, what are some of the other studies that you guys have done? I, I understand you're based in Switzerland. We are based in Switzerland. We're we're based in the French speaking part of Switzerland over in um, in Lausanne. Oh, okay. And uh, and we've we basically developed you know, after, of course, seeing these positive effects in in these on muscle function in animals. We then uh, took that next step of preparing this for bringing this into humans, and so we went through the whole safety process, safety analysis process that is required to get through uh, the FDA GRASS procedure, which GRASS stands for generally regarded as safe. And so we've gone through that procedure for, um, for our pro- for urolithin A uh, that we've uh, branded as MitoPure. And we've then gone on to run uh, several clinical studies. So we've run um, four, we've completed four clinical studies with that and, uh, and we're engaging in a fifth one. So the first clinical study uh, looked at the bioavailability and the safety uh, of uh, MitoPure. And we also looked at uh, biomarkers, both in the blood and in the muscle, uh, after four weeks of taking MitoPure. And that first study is what we, what we showed was that we were able to uh, boost mitochondria uh, function through, and that we saw that through uh, looking at the biomarkers found in the, uh, in the muscle tissue. Uh, so we took the biopsies before and after, and those, uh, and the, and doing the analysis of gene expression in those samples, we were able to uh, see that the uh, that there's an upregulation in gene expression, particular to mitochondria. Wow! After only yeah. four weeks. Yeah, after four weeks of taking it. Yeah. Damn, that's crazy. And what kind of dosage were the participants uh, working with? Uh, Five hundred milligrams. Just and one a day. Uh, one a day in the morning. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I I get so excited when somebody comes to market with something that actually works. You know what I mean? Not, yeah. not to disparage the supplement companies out there, but you know, there's a lot of things that have claims and often don't have studies or that, you know, don't work that quickly or have something that you can actually quantify. That's pretty impressive. Right. Uh, what are any of the other studies that are interesting to you or that you've done or yeah. that you plan to do? Yeah, so the two other studies uh, that we've finished up recently uh, that that looked at uh, more physiological function were four months in length. So we looked at one, one of the studies, we looked at 40 to 65-year-olds uh, who were sedentary and overweight and uh, and had a lower mitochondrial function. We screened for that coming in through just physical activity and physical performance. Uh, and, and then we had another study where we looked at individuals 65 and older, and, uh, and these people were also screened for low mitochondrial function. We used a more, uh, sophisticated way of doing that through a, a process called MRS, which is called, which is magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And that allows us to look non-invasively at ATP levels and, and mitochondrial function in the muscle. And, uh, in both of those studies, we see, um, we observe similar uh, impact on the uh, on mitochondrial gene expression, uh, and well, one in the um, in the in the study in the forty to sixty five, we we also performed biopsies, and then in both studies we looked at uh, the levels in the blood of biomarkers, in particular acylcarnitine levels, that we saw were uh, decreasing uh, after this four week period. An acylcarnitine level is um, is a hallmark of mitochondrial function in general at a systemic level. Uh, as the mitochondria use more uh, use acylcarnitine, so when you see acylcarnitine levels uh, go down, that's uh, an indication that it's improving. Wow, that's pretty cool. And then, what about uh, where where are mitochondria mostly centered in your body? Are they highly concentrated in the heart and the brain is that kind of well skeletal we find a lot in, mu- in muscle skeletal muscle uh cardiac muscle uh the brain of course um mitochondria are found in in essentially all of our cells with the exception of red blood cells uh and yeah and and as we were saying you know the muscle is the muscle in the brain are, are key organs where mitochondria are playing an important role and so if somebody's mitochondria are in tip-top shape, what's the subjective experience of that? You know, does one have clearer thinking, athletic performance? If somebody's just rocking with their mitochondria and ATP production, what's the difference between that person and someone who is, you know, having um, a dysfunction in that area? 
Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, if you're having mito- your mitochondria uh, firing on all cylinders, so to speak, uh, your from a, a athletic performance uh, perspective, you, you should you should be at the top of your game, right? It should also, in terms of your muscle functions, your muscle should be in just in generally functioning uh, better. So, uh, yeah, if you think about uh, if you think about older people who have um, problems walking, we did a study um, before all of our interventional studies with um, with urolithin A. We did a study where we looked at older people who were on average about 70 years old. And we looked at, uh, we compared people who were for very um, active uh, running on a regular basis to those who are considered pre-frail. And uh, pre-frail are people who have a problem sort of getting up out of their chair and they can't walk very fast. And, and what we saw, the main difference between these two populations was the decline in mitochondrial function in, in that uh, pre-fail population. So, uh, it's a, it's a really good, uh, indication of, you know, where you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to have, uh, impaired mitochondrial function because in the end it's, it becomes sort of a, a vicious circle. If you have impaired mitochondrial function, your, you know, you'll be, your muscles won't be as, um, yeah, you, you won't have that same endurance that, that you will have when you have a, a, a robust mitochondrial function. And then you'll, you'll move less. And then as a consequence of moving less, you'll have uh, even lower function. Uh, kind of a vicious cycle, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who wants to work out when you don't feel great and you don't have the energy to do so, right? Right, exactly. So it's like self-defeating cycle. So then you just st- start working out and moving and exercising less and less and less over time. And then your mitochondria suffers as a result of that inactivity essentially too. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, I'm assuming that this would be your lesson A would be something to improve athletic performance. Do you have any um, anecdotal or or studies regarding like high performing athletes that are improving their performance, muscle function, et cetera? Well, after the after these most recent two studies where we showed an improvement in muscle strength after four weeks um, in in this 40 to 65 population and and muscle endurance in the um, in the 65 and older population. We this this encouraged us to continue our clinical investigations, and so we've launched another study um, that we announced earlier this year in uh, professional athletes. Uh, and so now we've we're in the process of evaluating uh, urolithin A in, in athletes. Cool. Is um, is the mitochondrial dysfunction part of what? Um, makes it more difficult as you age to build muscle like density of muscle you know i I notice i'm 50 now i notice within my own body i mean i'm working out fairly regularly now but Mm -hmm. the minute i stop i just get gooey you know what i mean it's not it's just different the muscle's different than it was in my in my earlier days how much of that has to do with mitochondria and your ability to put on and keep muscle on basically well, they're, they're slightly different uh, things, but what we do know is that mitochondrial function is, is very important for the, the functioning of your, um, your muscle cells. And so, you know, however large your muscles are, what's important is that they function well. And so, you know, there have been uh, previous studies in the pharmaceutical space where uh, drugs have been tested and they've improved uh, muscle mass by a few percent, but no improved functionality. So I think that it's the functionality that you need to really think about. And and one aspect of having improved mitochondrial function is that you're ensuring that you're at least putting yourself in a position that you have an optimal functionality um, from a bioenergetic standpoint. Got it. And are there any issues with a high-performing athlete that would supplement with something like MitoPure? In no, terms of, you know, doping and no, like uh, Mito Pure or in your lithin A does, does not contain any banned substances. Uh, it's uh, it's a pure substance. It's been and we've been we've been exposed to it for for literally centuries uh, because we've been taking pomegranate juice and nuts, um, yeah, since the dawn of time. What is the history of uh, pomegranate culturally around the world? Is there documentation of Kind of health benefits of pomegranate in general, and if so, what cultures kind of gravitated toward that? I think of uh, 
Middle Eastern food often incorporates pomegranate, for example. Is there anything you know about that? Like the, the early origins of people identifying it as a beneficial food? Well, well certainly pomegranates are growing best in these arid uh, climates. And so the Middle East and in the Mediterranean, there's lots of pomegranates that are growing and you'll, um, yeah, whether it's in Turkey or in, or in, you know, Southern Italy or even, uh, yeah, even in Egypt, uh, I, I guess there's, I've seen some, uh, yeah, some documents, uh, around how pomegranates were, or back used back in Egyptian times. So, and consumed back in the Egyptian times and linked to, uh, you know, health and, and prosperity, if you will. Uh, so, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how that all, all came till today. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think people continue to eat it because of its health benefits, uh, I think in general. Uh, and yeah, it's great to. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, when you look at, um, different foods that have, um, health benefits throughout history, I wonder sometimes just how much of that is folklore and how much of it is ancient wisdom that's that's legitimate you know it seems like yeah. humans gravitate towards certain certain natural foods and yeah. sometimes there's a mythology around certain foods right that they yeah. have these superpowers and maybe sometimes they do and sometimes they don't but the fact that you guys have found something in there that is this meaningful and you're starting to validate scientifically is really interesting you know i wonder how many other things we're going to discover that the you know our ancestors ate that you know, are actually superfoods in the truest sense. Yeah, I think uh, I think at least today, with with all the tools we have uh, in terms of uh, uh, on the biologist uh, bench, if you will, that now there's it, this opens the door to exploring a lot of the foods that that people have been taking, uh, yeah, for centuries for different types of medicinal uh, benefits and exploring what actually inside of them causes these benefits. Yeah, well, it's like um, with urolithin A, I mean, I think if it weren't for science, we wouldn't really even understand that. We just go, oh, my grandmother ate pomegranates and she said they're good for you, but we wouldn't really know. So I think, as you mentioned earlier, the, the ability that we have now to extract the stuff that really matters from these, these foods and actually yep. you know, create supplements out of them. Um, do you see there any potential downside when we're kind of in a sense um, bypassing nature's wisdom you know and, and creating isolates from things when there are other uh, components of those like cofactors and other molecules that the creator or nature put into foods and now we're kind of going oh we want this one thing like thinking of willow bark with aspirin or something like that you know are there things that we might be missing there by extracting isolates well, certainly, there's um, we can cons we consume foods for the ensemble of all the benefits of all the components, um, uh, whether it's the yeah you know, the phyto components or it, the vitamins or the minerals or or even protein uh, levels, and so it's important not to sort of go from uh, it take that dramatic shift and go directly to uh, only taking supplements with uh, with specific components, but you have to you have to maintain a very healthy diet. But I think the you know the message is really that you, even if you eat a healthy diet, you don't necessarily get the levels of certain components that you may need, and so that you may need to supplement them in order to get those levels. And that's particularly the case of urolithin A, where the active compound isn't really found in the foods you eat and it's your body that that develops it basically and converts it and so if you're not able to convert it naturally uh then uh, you can eat all of the foods you'd like that contain these lagitannins and and you won't be exposed to your lithin a and so right. and so that's the best and when you and when you can take a, a supplement like your lithin a at a particular dose that's been tested to show a certain benefit I think that's where, um, you know, when you have that science ar ar around uh, those uh, those comp specific components and the specific levels, that's when you should feel the most comfortable to take a product um, as opposed to other products that have been less rigorously uh, evaluated in the clinic um, and 
and are offered at all kinds of different doses or even you're given the opportunity to take whatever dose you'd like where you know you're making a decision without having that that really robust science to help guide you speaking of robust science and the studies that you did so if you did the studies that you did with humans based on one serving one of these that's 500 milligrams um is there any diminishing return or waste if someone wanted to take four of these because <laughs> it's always the way i think well i'm like ah, 500 milligrams is good then 25 must be better yeah. is there any point to one that's you know say a high performing person whether they want um you know mental prowess and acuity or physical performance is there um, a cutoff point where you know you're kind of wasting your money by taking more or is is just more and more better well in our first two studies we uh we evaluated 500 milligrams and 1,000 milligrams. Um, and we showed that there was a, a, a slight increase in performance or in mitochondria activity at uh, 1,000 milligrams. And then in the third study that we uh, conducted, we, we only used the dose of 1,000 milligrams in our 65 plus population. And we showed an improvement in, um, in endurance there. And so I would say that anywhere between 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams, you should expect to um, to see some uh, improvement of your mitochondrial function. And um, how long does it take in terms of dosing in the in the immediate? If, like I took a packet of this this morning, and thank you for bringing those up because I, I didn't get a lot of sleep. I was like, mitochondrial function. Ah, I'm interviewing the right guy. Um, <laughs> in the in the immediate, so you know, I take a glass of uh, of Mito Pure in the morning how long in the immediate does it take for me to actually metabolize that and start to see the effects? And then in the, in the longer term, and I don't know how long these studies are, but you know, is there a cumulative effect after three months or six months or nine months or something yeah. like that? Well, so uh, in terms of an immediate effect, when you consume, uh, when you consume MitoPure, about six to eight hours after uh, intake, you'll have uh, a peak in your blood uh, in terms of the level of uh, urolithin A. And, and if you want to have, we've, what we've seen in our studies after seven days, uh, you have a, you sort of reach a steady state in your blood and, um, and yeah, we've done, uh, studies as long as uh, four months and, and we see that's, this is the time point where we start to see improvements in, uh, in muscle strength and in a separate study, uh, that's still yet published. Uh, we start to also see benefits as early as two months in, on muscle function and muscle, uh, endurance so and what's your uh consumer business model is do you guys do like a subscription of this or do people just order it you know um off the cuff or how do, how do you guys actually market your product i'm curious well we're a digital native brand and so we sell it through our website timeline nutrition.com okay and uh and we sell two month four month and 12 month plans uh and we provide those to you uh, right when you purchase them oh cool yeah awesome and in terms of um, urolithin A and the world outside of uh, your company, are there other people doing research or trying to develop products or looking into this, or is this just really a very narrow niche that you guys have found and, and focused on? Well, uh, in terms of the research, there there are a, a number of labs around the world that are doing research on urolithin A, which is very encouraging to see that we, you know, when we published our one of our first papers in um, in Nature Medicine. Um, several years ago, this sort of encouraged uh, uh, other scientists to to look at urolithin A because it was the first compound uh, that was shown to be an inducer of mitophagy, and so this this then um, yeah led to additional research in other areas that are outside of the muscle um, health space, if you will. And so um, yeah, so that's that's sort of the is what's nice to see is that there's a lot of scientists going after. Uh, urolithin A in terms of exploring its uh, its benefits and its activity in, in the lab and in preclinical setting. And um, yeah, yeah. That's, that saves you guys the, the research work, right? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what I'm thinking about with uh, mitochondrial function, you know, as we've talked about, you know, uh, muscle health and uh, physical performance and endurance yeah. and things like that. Are any are you guys or any of those other scientists that are starting to get hip to this um, looking at at brain function, cognition, memory, things like that? Because your brain obviously is using tons of energy to 
process. Uh, and I'm assuming that that energy comes from ATP also to some degree. Yeah. So uh, we're not particularly studying uh, the impact of urolithin A on, on brain function, but there have been other publications by, by other laboratories um, that, have, that are working independently of us. And there was one publication showing that uh, urolithin A was in animal models of uh, Alzheimer's disease, that it was improving function in, in the Alzheimer's disease mice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so that's very, that's, I mean, it's, that's pretty compelling. It's, yeah, it's very encouraging, of course, uh, going from translating from mouse to a human in, in, in Alzheimer's disease is a, is a huge step. Yeah. Um, how do they give mice Alzheimer's? <laughs> I'm just curious. Well, my, there's, there are genetic uh, models of Alzheimer's disease. Oh, okay. um, so, and, and these genetic models, uh, the mice, <clears throat> the mice have a slow degeneration of, uh, of, of the brain and of, uh, yeah, their neurons, and that leads to the these type of memory loss. And so, uh, by in in these pub in this publication, by administering urolithin A, they were able to show that there was less of a memory loss, uh, and there was an improvement in in the memory function. So, wow. Uh, so I, I think you know it would be interesting to, of course, assess the the benefits of urolithin A on the brain. We've been very focused on the muscle. Uh, we see. We see the muscle as sort of the sort of ground zero for health. If you stop moving, then all of your health kind of declines after that. So trying to keep people, you know, muscle at the peak performance. And then, you know, perhaps in the future, we'll take a look at the effect of uh, urolithin A on, um, yeah, on memory. Cool. We'll have to see. If somebody uh, is using this for physical performance, is there an optimal time to dose? You know, say someone takes um, amino acids and creatine and... Yeah, um, you know, um, beetroot powder and things like that. Is there a time, like before intense workout or something, that this would be beneficial, or is it more generalized and just long term? I would say uh, taking it in the morning is is the way that we've um, that that we suggest that people take the product. I know some people take morning and evening. Uh, you'll have to sort of everyone has to try for themselves to see what works best. Um, yeah, all of our clinical studies are built on this concept of taking it in the morning, uh, around breakfast time. So, and, Got it. and the product itself, uh, I mean, it's a powder, it's a berry powder. You can mix it in yogurt, you can mix it into smoothies, put it on cereal. So it's, it's designed to, to allow people to incorporate it easy in their morning routine. I noticed that I, the past couple of days, I was just putting mine in water. I have my little hand blender and I see. it has a very mild flavor actually, yeah, you know, yeah. which is kind of cool. Cause oftentimes people put so many kind of um, artificial fake fruit flavorings yeah. and things, you know, yeah. and I'm sure, um, you know, speaking of like a amino acid uh, powder or something like that, and, yeah. cause amino acids taste really nasty. But if you think about you're consuming something day after day after day, that's kind of yeah. a lot of even natural flavoring, you know, which is a bit suspect to me. So that's one thing I noticed about this. It didn't have a lot of that fake fruity, sugary masking. It's just relatively innocuous in terms of its flavor profile. So it would be easy, I think, to mix and just about anything and you wouldn't even really notice. Yeah. And that was the that was the purpose. And you know, we felt that a berry, um, a berry powder is something that is appealing to most people and that sort of takes and, and it's also sort of a pomegranate, there's also a pomegranate in there. So that sort of links to our origin story as well. And uh, is there any issue with heating the mitopure? I mean, I don't know what hot food you would put into it. I'm just curious <laughs> if, if you could use it in a baking recipe or yeah. something like that, uh, you know, in a, um, you know, muffins or some kind of dessert or anything like that. Yeah, it's mitopure is, um, it's very heat stable. So people can uh, use that for, um, yeah, if in, in hot, beverages if they want or if they want to cook they you know they can they can do that as well um is there any um do you foresee in the future any way to increase the bioavailability of it um you know doing a liposomal or something like that where you're getting maximum absorption or do you find that just natural digestion is enough to get it all in there i think the formulations that we develop already are um you know very bioavailable and 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 I don't think, uh, at least for the moment, we need to focus on that um, because what we've seen from our clinical studies is that the levels that we're uh, administering are actually bioactive in the body and uh, giving people benefits. So uh, it's, I think now that it's more about 
uh, expanding the applications, studying it more in humans uh, for you know for different types of health benefits that would be linked to mitochondria, uh, and that's where I see the future going in terms of the clinical studies. Cool. Yeah, I think it's um, it's very compelling that you guys have targeted the mitophagy uh, because other than as you discussed fasting and different things like that that require a lot more discipline of someone sure you know it's kind of one and done and what keeps coming to mind is uh, a compound called spermidine i'm i'm sensing you might be familiar with it spermidine is yep. um in certain foods like uh, japanese natto fermented soybeans mm-hmm. and it's in foods that aren't very palatable and it's hard to get a lot of it so i, I interviewed a woman named uh, leslie kenny from a company called primadine uh-huh. and uh, the spermidine is cellular autophagy and it, mm-hmm. it really improves that. And there's tons of studies similar to yours that prove mm-hmm. that. So I was thinking that's a pretty good one-two punch if you can get the mitophagy and autophagy, you know, boosted up at the same time. I just had an idea for a stack. <laughs> Are you familiar with that? Have you looked into spermidine at all? Well, uh, I'm, I'm familiar a little bit with the science, although I don't think okay. it's translated clinically. So okay. um, I, what I can say is that uh, currently the only... Uh, nutritional product that is translated clinically for and then showed an improved mitochondrial function that's a mitophagy inducer has been um, uh, urolithin A. Got It'll it. be very interesting to see what, you know, what will happen with uh, spermidine and, and if the findings that they've shown in, in animals and in cells actually translate into humans. Yeah, cool, man. Cool. And uh, what do you see in the future? Do you guys have any ideas of further developments or, or studies? What, what's happening next for you guys? Because you're a relatively new company, right? How long have you guys been doing this? Well, we were actually incorporated back in 2007. So, oh, really? So there's over 10 years of research oh, no shit. Be- behind this. Yeah. I just figured, well, I just saw it come to market and I kind of am on the cutting edge. So yeah. I think of this stuff. Yeah. So we just launched the product just over a year ago. And, wow. So yeah. that much R&D went into it? Yeah. So a significant Damn. amount of R&D has gone into this. So uh, I think this, this also should uh, let consumers feel comfortable taking products where they've been really deeply studied over the years as opposed to taking a product and just sort of putting it out in the market before it's even been evaluated properly. I'm curious from an entrepreneurial standpoint, um, when you're taking that long of a runway to do R&D, how do you guys pay, pay your bills in the meantime? Were you guys independently wealthy or you know had other careers and you did this as a side gig while you were in the R&D and then finally went, all right, we're going all in with this? Well, no, it, it's like uh, most startups that you know, we have an investor base that, okay. um, that stay with us over the years. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sticking it out, man. That's That's a long time to really work with something before coming to market. I think a lot of people that are kind of um, in the supplement game tend to, in some cases, and you know, not to uh, disparage them, but I think in some cases somebody discovers something and they just kind of throw it on the market and start, you know, marketing yeah. it heavily, and then we find out later, eh, it's not really doing what it's supposed to do, or in some cases even maybe have some side effects. And, and that's, and I think that's one of the big problems in the dietary supplement space that there's not enough robust science that goes into the development before things are launched. And so um, that's why we, you know, we're really glad about uh, our product and bring our product to people. And we, yeah, we, we think that people should be able to benefit from this and, and the ongoing science and research that we uh, will be doing in humans uh, so they can understand how it will affect different aspects of their, um, yeah, of their livelihood. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to to dive into this with me. It's very, very compelling, and I'm definitely going to be grabbing some more of this from you guys and and giving it a, a shot. You know, I think um, as as we age, as you know, and we've discussed, um, energy is a huge factor. You know, it's like if you don't have energy, you don't have life. You don't have anything. So I'm always kind of having my antennae up for things that have to do with mitochondria and energy and just performance in general. So, yeah. So thank you for doing that and putting in the, you know, possibly unrewarding work in some respects along the way to actually take your time and do it right. It's very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me today. This has been, uh, yeah, it's been great. Yeah, man. Uh, so I got one last question for you. Who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that you might share with us in any category? Oh, good question. Um, uh well i think uh teachings and um and entrepreneurial 
and entrepreneurship, I think is, uh, I think one of the key teachings in entrepreneurship is just um, persistence. I mean, we spoke a little bit about that and in the length of time that it takes. Sometimes uh, discoveries take time and that, um, yeah, being persistent, uh, you know, is, you know, pays off and there's no sort of magic solution that happens uh, instantly there. Except cryptocurrency. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, I don't know, I'm no expert, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be said for for that principle. You know, I think a lot, especially younger people that yeah. have entrepreneurial ambitions, it's like yeah. the get rich quick kind yeah. of mindset yeah. and some yeah. and some do and many yeah. don't. Uh, two more. Um, good question. Um, I love when I spring this on people. Some people are like, they rattle off three and it could be like, my mom, my grandma, my dad, you know, something like that. And some people are like Buddha, Jesus. Uh, so it's, it's fun for me to see people squirm, but um, think of like a, uh, like a book or uh, a public figure or a philosophy or something. So I love that stick to and patience and entrepreneurship. That's a great start. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have another one for you right <laughs> yeah, now. Fine. I'm sorry. I'll let you off the hook. No, that's fine, dude. <laughs> I'll let you off the hook. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I like that question. Is yeah. Sometimes people are like, uh, but you already provided us, Chris, with tons of value today and great Thank information. You. And you're onto something you. super cutting edge that's yeah. validated. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate your work. So thank you for coming on. Uh, I guess in closing, just give us um, any websites or social media links where people can find you guys. Sure. TimelineNutrition.com. This is our uh, our website for the timeline nutrition product and um and then of course we we're also on instagram and facebook and you can find us there as well awesome man well thank you so much for joining us thank you